Coming up in today's newscast, the Israeli military again warns Hamas in Gaza against inflaming tensions along the border. The new Miss Holocaust survivor is crowned in Haifa, and a new Israeli brain scanning software gets FDA approval. IAF jets opened fire on a group of Palestinians in the northern Gaza Strip this morning as the cell was launching incendiary balloons into Israel. No injuries from the strike were reported, but the incident comes after a recent rise in flaming kite attacks. The incendiary kites and balloons were coming into Israel on a near daily basis for months, but recently frequency has been in a relative lull. That is until this week. Riots and protests along the Gaza border haven't been much different, however, as terrorists continue to attack the Israeli border and the IDF soldiers stationed along it. Yesterday, the Gaza Health Ministry reported 32 Palestinians wounded by Israeli fire during the mass protests along the beach. Gaza rioters threw flaming tires over the security barrier and boats with Palestinian flags approached the blockade. Just hours earlier, two terrorists in the southern Gaza Strip planted an explosive near the border fence. The explosion did cause damage to the barrier, but thankfully no IDF soldiers were hurt. The Israeli Air Force responded by firing on Hamas positions. Israel regularly responds in this fashion, either with riot dispersal methods or with live return fire, depending on the situation on the ground. Monday in the Knesset, Prime Minister Netanyahu reiterated that Israel will do, quote, everything to prevent unnecessary wars, end quote, but will also not hesitate if need be. Defense Minister Lieberman also threatened that Hamas would need to heed Israel's warnings if it didn't want to see another war in the Strip. The defense minister already halted fuel shipments last weekend in response to continued violence. Hamas, however, has responded by calling Israel's bluff, saying the Palestinians aren't intimidated by Israel's, quote, empty threats. So a potential war in Gaza is now again looming over our heads. And returning to the studio with his insights on the subject is Dr. Martin Sherman, the founder and executive director of the Israel Institute of Strategic Studies. Dr. Sherman, thanks again for joining with us. Thank you for having me back. All right, so first of all, you know, what should the goal be? Where, where should Israel's aim, uh, you know, or eye line be set at right now? Well, you know, as I said before, the problem in Gaza is not operational. It's conceptual. Or rather, it's operational because it's conceptual. The question is where you see this process going. And if you visualize that there will always be a permanent Arab presence in Gaza, then you're in an impasse. Because there will, as I've said before many times, there will either be Jews in the Negev or Arabs in Gaza, but in the long run, there won't be both. And you can see what's been going on. Life has become impossible for people around the Gaza Strip on the Israeli side for six months. And, uh, you know, uh, Every time the Arabs develop a mode of attack, Israel develops a mode of defense. So there were terrorist attacks, so we put up a fence. And then they developed uh, overhead rockets, so we developed the Iron Dome. And then they d started d digging tunnels, so we've now put a billion dollar barrier to cut off their tunnels. And now they're flying over the barrier incendiary balloons and kites, and it's only a matter of time until they use... Yeah, we're using drones and all use drones, and, 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 and my greatest fear is that on those drones are going to carry non-conventional uh, warheads, some chemical or biological package that will explode over a Jewish community. And, uh, you, you know, uh, things have got so bad. If, if anyone had said that what we have today is what we will have, what we would have had uh, in 2005, you would have been dismissed. As, as a scaremonger and a warmonger, because then, you know, the, the, the most uh, uh, threatening weapon they had was a short-range rocket with a range of five kilometers and, and an explosive head of, quarter, of a half a kilogram. Now you have 100 kilograms and, 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 and 100 kilometer range, well, together with naval capacities and tunnels, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you, the question is how you look at the people in Gaza. If you see the Gazans as a prospective peace partner or what, the way you really should see them as an implacable enemy and derive your policy from that. Well, but again, okay, so, so but let's kind of get down into the details of, of such a 
you know, because you're talking again in the conceptual and the theoretical, so now let's take that into the applicable, into the objective and, and the operational. Um, we're talking about two million people roughly, give or take, in Gaza. Maybe, maybe a tenth of that, probably less, is actually operation is actually operating uh, terrorist attacks and things like that. We're talking mostly Hamas and their affiliates and other small uh, organizations in the Strip. So if Israel were to operate, were to launch an operation, say even at the end of the week, in Gaza, what would the goal, what should the goal be? Should it, I mean, because it's unrealistic to to envision that Israel is just going to kick out two million people in, well, you know, in a few days. You know, well, it's not, first first of all. Um, you know, I, I think the long-term goal of Gaza must be deconstruction, and not reconstruction of Gaza. And uh, so, should should any future operation near or far be focused on usurping Hamas? Well, not as or going further. The, the going only the that. only way the only way Israel control can control who rules Gaza is by controlling it itself. And we've seen that we withdrew from Gaza in 2005, handed the control over to the Fatah. And it was taken away by by Hamas. By Hamas. Mm -hmm. And you must you must realize now that, that Gaza abuts the the, the Sinai Peninsula, which is a jihadi no man land. Mm -hmm. The Egyptians are having great difficulty in imposing law and order there. So if you if you weaken Hamas, there's no guarantee that what will come after Hamas will be better or worse. It might might well be sure. much worse. And and the and the, the the only the only solution is and and I've seen more and more Israeli pundits beginning to to understand this. The only solution is is to take over Gaza and start a program of incentivized immigration. Some people have have, have talking about uh, sure. convincing Sisi to open up open up the the, the passage into Sinai with well, American that sounds, support. But that's unlikely. So, uh, well, I, I, Maybe what, what's unlikely is is finding some solution if we carry on doing the same and the same. All right. Well, Dr. Sherman, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming back in. Thank you. I meanwhile, looking to the north, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu said on Monday at the start of the Knesset's winter session that Israel is continuing to act against Iranian advancement in Syria while remaining in consistent contact with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Netanyahu said that his relationship with Putin is mutual and very important as it allows him to deal with the challenges in the region. But he went on to say that despite how important his friendship with Russia is, quote, the most important of all is the alliance we've established with our greatest friend, the United States. Not only is the Trump administration committed to support us when it comes to security, the American president has also elevated the United States support for Israel at the United Nations to a whole new level. We are in the eye of the storm with the turbulent Middle East around us, but I will not let the storm shake us, end quote. In line with those comments, a secret Israeli and American military delegation was reportedly sent to the Ukraine to test out the Russian-made S-300 missile defense system the very same system that Russia recently delivered to Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Neither Israel nor the United States have responded for comment about this delegation, but reports say that the Ukrainian army educated their guests on the S-300's capabilities and helped run various test scenarios. This isn't the first time Israeli Air Force is allegedly trained against the S-300 either, with some reports dating back to joint exercises in Greece as far back as 2007. And now Israel's fleet of F-35s are back in full service too, just in time for scheduled Air Force drills yesterday and today across the country. All signs clearly seem to point to Netanyahu sticking to his guns in defending Israel's continued, quote, legitimate activity in Syria against Iran and its proxies, end quote. In other news, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's chief defense lawyer, Yaakov Weinot, died suddenly on Tuesday morning at the age of 71. Weinwot was battling cancer, and reports show that he had been sick for a while and was visibly frail in interviews that he gave over the past year. But there were no indications of the end being so near, and he even continued to work almost to his very last day. Yaakov Weinroth was one of Israel's most outstanding attorneys. He founded the Dr. J. Weinroth & Company law firm, which over the years became a leading office specializing in white-collar crimes. Prime Minister Netanyahu issued a statement saying that he and his wife were, quote, shocked with sadness and that Yaakov was exceptional in his personality, his wisdom, his mental acuity, his sense of justice, and his loyalty to his people. This is a great loss to his family, friends, and his admirers, and it's a great loss to the Israeli justice system, end quote. But in recent years, Weinroth has been mostly identified with representing the Netanyahu's in various legal cases. He was supposed to start trial as representative for Sarah Netanyahu on October 7th, but pulled out just a few days prior, saying that his firm believed they should have reached a settlement deal, which was never agreed upon by either Sarah or the Attorney General. As for the Prime Minister's cases, Weinroth's death obviously raises many questions as to whom will lead the defense in the ongoing investigations. 
The representation of prominent people doesn't end there, though. He also represented Avigdor Lieberman in the 2013 Belarus ambassador affair, former President Ezer Weizmann, Minister Rafael Eitan, Meir Shitrit, and a variety of other major officials. Israel indeed suffered an outstanding loss in the legal system, and only time will tell how things play out. He leaves behind a wife and six children. According to a recent announcement by Australia's new Prime Minister Scott Morrison, the newly elected leader is, quote, open to moving the Australian embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. As anticipated, however, while the move would strengthen Israel's position on Jerusalem internationally, the prospect of the move has already also sparked intense debate. First, Morrison is an evangelical Christian, raising fears that his decision was made on the basis of faith. The Australian Premier denied the accusation, though, continuing that he's in support of a two-state solution, but that the topic of Jerusalem must not be taboo. Now, the first thing I want to stress very strongly is the government's commitment to a two-state uh, solution uh, in the Middle East remains, has always been, and I believe always will be, Australia's policy in relation to the resolution of issues of Israel and Palestine. Uh, but at the same time, what we are simply doing is being open to that suggestion as a potential way forward. And I'm not going to close my mind off to things that can actually be done better and differently to aid the great cause of Australian uh, foreign policy. The orthodoxy that has driven this debate, which says issues like considering the question of the capital are taboo, I think we have to challenge that. As Australians are pretty upfront people, and I think we have to show the courage of our convictions in saying we're prepared to talk about other ways about achieving this goal, because frankly, the other ways have not been getting us there terribly successfully. But the biggest criticism Morrison received was from the Palestinian representative to Australia, Izzat Saleh Abdul Hadi, who called Morrison's consideration of the move, quote, deeply disturbing. He said that it would only reinforce the United States' approach of taking the status of Jerusalem and the Palestinian refugees' right of return off the table. Morrison insisted the United States had nothing to do with the decision, however, yet did confirm speaking with Netanyahu, who tweeted his thanks to Morrison for considering the move. Ever since Trump declared the United States' intentions to move the embassy to Jerusalem last December, Israel has been trying to persuade other countries to follow suit. As of now, only Guatemala has made the announcement to move its embassy as well, so having Australia even consider the relocation too is seen as a huge step. Israel's October 30th municipal elections are quickly approaching, but now just a few weeks ahead of voting day, the Israeli National Cyber Directorate has revealed that social media giant Facebook has just deleted thousands of fake accounts which attempted to influence the vote. The findings were reported Monday at a hearing of the Knesset Science and Technology Committee. Fake social media accounts have become a major concern in every election around the world, but especially after the 2018, uh, 2016 election of Donald Trump, where Russian media teams allegedly influenced voters through misinformation spread across thousands of fake users. And this is an ongoing issue. From January to March of 2018 alone, Jordana Cutler, the head of the policy at Facebook Israel, said uh, Facebook had removed over 583 million profiles worldwide. Despite Facebook's efforts so far, however, Erez uh, Tithar, Israel's cyber directorate's guidance manager, told the Knesset committee on Monday that he expects a major uptick in fake user activity in the weeks to come. He said, quote, ahead of the election, it will be money time for us, and we expect escalation, so we will upgrade our team and work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, end quote. Similarly, Kulanu Knesset member Rachel Azaria commented that, quote, the amount of fake news in the local race has been unfathomable, end quote and that she doesn't even want to imagine what will happen in the upcoming national race. But also speaking at the committee hearing Monday evening was Karin Nachon, the president of Israel's Internet Association, and she was less concerned about the social media manipulations as she was about the apparatus designed to address it. She asked, who's overseeing this? Adding that, uh, that it should be a collaboration with the elections committee and not the cyber directorate, which is more closely related to Israel's defense systems. But Facebook's Jordana Cutler put this concern to bed as well, insisting that there is no secret arrangement and that Facebook receives requests from the government but isn't committed to them. She said, quote, we operate based solely on our community standards, end quote, and that the election committee, Facebook, and the cyber directorate are all in constant communication. Moving on, the annual Miss Holocaust Survivor Beauty Pageant concluded Sunday night, and so now I'm very excited to present to you our 2018 winner, 93-year-old great-grandmother from Poland, Tova Ringer. What can I tell you? I wouldn't believe that at my age I will be a beauty. <laughs> 
Tova and the other 11 contestants in this annual event all strutted their stuff, albeit at times with help, down the Haifa catwalk, and thousands came from all over to watch, including family members, ministers, Knesset members, and hundreds of other survivors of the Nazi death camps. It is very important for my generation to know the history, the history of the Holocaust of the Shoah. And it's very important for me also to support, to support these miserable people. The pageant, organized by the Yad Ezer Lechaver, or the Helping Hand Organization, began in 2012 as a way to celebrate life and spread joy to survivors of one of the worst human tragedies in history. And since taking off with an explosive first year, the event has returned nearly every year since then. Some have criticized the event as macabre and exploitative, though, arguing that the pageant cheapens the memory of the millions murdered during the Shoah, and that a one-time pageant wouldn't enrich the survivors' lives in any meaningful way. But just try explaining how meaningless the event is to the hundreds who have participated or wanted to participate in the past, or the newly crowned queen, Tova Ringer, who lost four sisters, parents, and grandparents during the Nazi genocide. I'm very happy. It's just something special. I was always very, very happy to be here with the people. And I don't have words for the people they're walking here. It's impossible that, that they have given so much uh, coa, so much uh, heart for us. It's, it's unbelievable. Runners-up in the competition included a 74-year-old teacher and two 81-year-old retirees who worked as a gynecologist and a gas technician. The average contestant was 90 years old, and today, fewer than just 200,000 Holocaust survivors remain alive in the Jewish state. Speaking of the aging community, having a stroke is a terrible and terrifying experience. They are very time-sensitive, and every second matters in identifying and treating a stroke. So imagine having artificial intelligence technology that can automatically detect when a patient is having a stroke and directly alerts the physician on duty. Well, that technology was created by Israeli company Viz, and today we have the Viz CTO and co-founder David Golan here to tell us all about it. David, thank you very much for being in here with us. Thanks for inviting me. So it, it's my pleasure, first of all, but let's get started. Tell, tell me a little bit about Viz, how it works, and how you came about creating it. Okay, so the big problem with stroke is time. We have uh, life-saving treatment, uh, but for that to be effective, it needs to be administered as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And every second counts, every minute counts. One minute will slate to a one week, one week loss of a healthy life for wow. the patient. Um, our goal is to cut down those times and we leverage artificial intelligence for that purpose. Uh, our artificial intelligence hooks into all the CT scanners in the hospitals, okay. gets all the scans, identifies the strokes and alerts the physicians in real time on, you know, this patient needs your attention ASAP. So can it, can it catch a stroke before it really hits? Or, you know, can it catch based on the symptoms that lead to a stroke? No, so this is integrated with the CT scanner. It turns out that the biggest delays are not from onset of stroke to getting to the hospital, but actually in the hospital. Really? Uh, people get to smaller hospital, periphery hospitals that are, um, less well versed with treating stroke patients mm -hmm. and it actually takes up to 25 minutes to get to the CT scanner but an hour and a half to get from the scanner to the attention mm -hmm. of the right doctor. So this okay. is the time that we're eliminating. So okay, now I understand that there's an application that comes with this that's used by doctors then? Yes, now the doctor that can treat this patient, he can be anywhere. Maybe they're in the ER but maybe they're in their clinic, maybe they're yeah. at home, maybe they're asleep. Right, so sure. we're, we want to be in their pocket. We're, we have an app on their mobile device. It rings very loudly when, when we detect a stroke and allows them to immediately take out their mobile device, view the scan, make a decision and continue treating the patient and take ownership of the treatment of the patient from that point onwards. So, okay, so first of all, how many, how many hospitals are utilizing this technology? How many doctors, you know, and, and where, where do you hope to export this to next? Okay, so we, we're, um, we're currently we're FDA cleared. This is the first uh, AI-based technology cleared by the FDA ever. Congratulations. Thank you. And so we're now we're selling in the U.S. market. Uh, we're installed in dozens of hospitals in the U.S., uh, including several very big and very prestigious uh, hospital mm -hmm. networks. Uh, we're also running a trial in Israel uh, led by Rambam Hospital. Okay. So we're running there and aiming to distribute in the rest of Israel as part of the trial. That's incredible. And, and, and again, you know, what inspired the creation of this technology? You know, why, what made you focus on, on stroke? 
Um, so first of all, the, the stroke field is undergoing a major disruption in the last three years with the introduction of mechanical thrombectomy, mm -hmm. which is this time, this life-saving treatment that can help those stroke patients. Okay. So that's like the general uh, opportunity for a field that's undergoing a transformation and needs technology to help it help the patients. Uh, you know, also the co-founders, Chris Mancy, the CEO and myself come with our personal experience. Chris is a neurosurgeon. So he lives and breathes this, uh, used to live and breathe this in, in practice. So this, this hits home for him. This yes, is like definitely. a personal kind of issue. Definitely. Uh, you know, he, he, he lives and you know, he sees patients that he could have saved if he had known about them earlier. Of course. And you know, I, I had my own personal experience with you know, getting hospitalized and, and, not, and having delayed in treatment, which sort of got me interested in, in this area and, and got me connected with Chris. And we sort of sat together and said, you know, I'm from the patient side and you're from the doctor side and we're both suffering, have witnessed the same issue, let's solve it with technology. That's incredible. All right, well, so first of all, I'm very excited to, that, to have you here and describing this uh, and I hope all the hospitals that are listening right now really take this into account Definitely. and that the doctors really download this and, and take it seriously. Um, but for the meantime, I believe there, there's like an acronym for, uh, for identifying a stroke. Right. Um, what, what is that? Well, uh, let's see, in English, I, th I think it's FAST. Yeah. So you need to, uh, to see the face, the facial droop sometimes, like mm -hmm. the smile drops on one side. So yes. face, arms, is, if there's yeah, one Yeah, do you have trouble weakness. raising them? Yeah. Uh, speech, if you have a slurred speech or problem producing speech or sure. understanding. And T, I think, is time. It means Which, if you see those three things, you need to rush to the hospital butt. as fast as possible. All right. That's, I think that's a good way to end it right there. Awesome. All right. So remember, FAST, remember Viz. David Gulan, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. All right, now on a related note with regards to artificial intelligence, Israeli-based company iDoc has just received approval by the United States Food and Drug Administration as well. iDoc's technology analyzes medical images to assist radiologists with life-threatening cases. The company's artificial intelligence-based software analyzes medical images and notifies radiologists of unusual findings. It also assists with prioritization in time-sensitive and rare cases. IDOC was founded in 2016 by a team of alumni from an elite technology unit in the Israeli army, and they've been selling their products outside the U.S. since December 2017. Today, the software is used on a daily basis in over 50 medical centers worldwide, analyzing over a million exams per year. Now, IDOC received its first approval from the FDA in August, and then earlier this month, IDOC was listed by Time Magazine as one of the 50 genius companies of 2018, along with other companies like Apple, Airbnb, and Spotify. Further, IDOC's brain scan product is supposedly the world's first deep learning solution that's been approved by the FDA. IDOC is now in the process of getting FDA clearance for its other products, and just in time, too. By providing iDoc software to analyze medical images at high speed, Time Magazine said it's helped practitioners save more than 50,000 hours of human work. The technology is also already being used in Ramat Gan at the Sheba Medical Center. Dr. Chen Hoffman, the head of Sheba Medical Center's neuroradiology department, said, quote, iDoc is providing radiologists with the most advanced solutions to increase efficiency and expedite patient care within their existing work environment. I feel confident that the iDoc solution has my back and lets me know when there's an urgent case that needs my attention." End quote. Thankfully, that same level of efficiency is now making its way to America. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. Since 93-year-old Tova Ringer was crowned Miss Holocaust Survivor 2018 this week, our word today is keter or crown. Now Tova wore her new keter or crown on her head proudly and beautifully the other night. But also our very own Wonder Woman, Gal Gadot, was given a crown or keter as Miss Israel back in 2004. And of course, let's not forget Gal's keter or crown that she wears as DC's Wonder Woman. Now, crowns or ketarim are usually given in pageants and contests or if you're some sort of royalty. But good news, all you would-be keter wearers, because Halloween is just around the corner, so you can just buy the keter or crown that we know you were always meant to wear for the day. Now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight will be partly cloudy and warm, but with scattered thunderstorms and a low of about 71 or 22 degrees Celsius. Then tomorrow you can expect cloudy skies and little changes in temperatures. The high should be around 81 or 27 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.64 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you for watching.